Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the Scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the Scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the Scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and as another Scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. What we have read there is, of course, uh, the record of John concerning the events of the crucifixion. That record can be supplemented and complemented by considering what you find in both Matthew and Mark and in Luke. And the variations that we discover are the kind of variations that you would find in three different newspapers. Um, a number of days this week, I took three newspapers in the morning, uh, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and some newspaper in Dallas. I don't know the name of it. And while I read the same article uh, the same, of the same incidents, I discovered that the way it was nuanced by each of the newspapers often had a distinctive quality of its own. The scene that is described, while quite striking to us, was a familiar scene within the framework of the Roman jurisdiction. 
Uh, the soldiers were carrying out their business as usual. What made it so significant was that the man who was hanging in the center cross was none other than God incarnate. And that the great event which was being carried out here was far more significant than these four soldiers ever would have realized. Indeed, eternity, as it were, was closing its eyes to the scene as darkness descends over the whole event. It's almost as though, as in the time of the Passover, in the book of Exodus, where God turned the lights out, so He turns the lights out again. Ordinarily, the procession that would have led to this event uh, would have begun in the relatively early hours of the morning before it became oppressively hot. Uh, four soldiers were assigned to the one who was to be crucified. In other words, there would have been twelve of them involved in the three who were to be crucified on this day. And ordinarily, a centurion led the procession. He, or someone designated to, would carry a sign on which was written the crime of the individual about to be crucified. They would routinely uh, go through the longest route possible to get to the site of the crucifixion, thereby prolonging the agony for the individuals involved and increasing the sense of morbid and cruel expectation on the part of the crowds that began to throng in their wake. Those of us who have pondered that, I'm sure we'll have a variety of reactions to the demands on the part of some of the family members to witness the death penalty being carried out. For myself, I find it an abhorrent idea, but I guess perhaps if I had been deeply wounded, as some have, I may have a different perspective. 